the parent and family resource, the human soul analogy and correcting unloving creations. An introduction to the human soul using the analogy of a glass of water and a simple pictorial view of how love can enter the soul and expel error. New truth can be received into the soul once we emotionally release false beliefs and emotional injuries out of harmony with love. This presentation includes brief comments on correcting the unloving creations we are responsible for as a parent. Recorded in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia, on the 23rd of March 2021 at 10.30am. So this is the analogy of our soul. Here we are, when, as God created us, and we've got our personality and nature, and we've sort of like got all these wonderful things going on. As we come down into, like we incarnate into the world and with our parents and when we're in utero and we're in the tummy and, you know, just growing physically, it's like we're absorbing all these different things. So from our out external environments, like we're absorbing all these different things from mum, from dad, from, you know, environment, from everything that's going on. We just are, are slowly, slowly absorbing, absorbing, absorbing and we're absorbing all of these different things into us. And they start like, you know, depending if they're loving or they're unloving. So you can absorb like loving things and unloving things. And they all start coloring our soul, if you like, putting in different beliefs and, you know, ways that we view the world and all that kind of stuff. It kind of darkens our soul. Depending on how much you absorb, depends on, you know, how much love you have or your beliefs and all those kind of things. But as a child, you're not, choosing what you what you what you um what goes into your soul it just sort of like absorbs and sponges everything in but you do it and then as you grow older you start making choices and decisions and now that is totally your issue like you making choices and decisions is about you so you choose one you know and once you chew I suppose a child around like seven between seven and sort of 13 you know that sort of transition period Children start making choices, they act on their own, you know, emotional injuries that they've inherited. If they believe what their parents believe, they'll act on those things. So they start having, you know, basically making their own decisions and taking action either to sin or to love. Sin being missing the mark of love. So, and being in harmony with God's laws or out of harmony with God's laws. So those are things that happen. So say if you choose loads and loads of unloving things and your soul's going to just get darker and darker and kind of like shrivel up and get smaller and smaller. If you choose to do more and more loving things, then all of this the darkness can get released and, you know, you have more love in your soul so it would be clearer. So I suppose you could say here you've done some releasing or, or, or you've received some of God's love or you could also say that, like sometimes as well, to I spoke to work through issues, you can receive some of God's love. And I'm not going to do this, but God's love can sort of pour in, and then imagine that it's sort of pour. Imagine that it's like pouring out over. It's, it would spill out the error if you like. Some that's how I imagine it. It's like love enters the soul and it pushes out error pushes out things that are unloving and out of harmony with love if if we have an opening and a desire for that or out of harmony with truth and so your soul can like get clearer and clearer as you work through issues and you become a more loving person until say so you have a completely pure soul and we could say that's like when you're at one with God in the sense of at one in regards to love and how God views love and then you'd have like a beautiful pristine soul and then after that it's just learning all these new things about your desires and um, how you know about God and about your soulmate and all of these kind of things, um, just all these desires and what your personality and nature is and what's your passions and desires. That's what I hear anyway. So while we're on Earth, working through certain issues, sometimes you know can feel a bit murky. We're a bit murky and not necessarily very loving, but we can you know gradually get more and more more loving, which would mean that our soul would get more clear of error and you know, sin and things that make us unhappy and cause pain and suffering. So, yeah, so that's like an analogy of, of our soul. It's not so good because I can't, when I pour the water in, like, say, illustrating God's love, it just sort of, like, dilutes it to lighter 
rather than like it's kind of like I need like you know different colored globs in there a little bit like say a lava lamp or something and then <laughs> pour it in and it pushes the globs out or makes it cleaner like around and then the globs are sort of an analogy for the the, the error that remains that then needs to be sorted out because you can gain you know you can gain some love on uh, from um, uh, from God and that can help you to to dispel sort of error and and receive truth on certain subjects but it can be you know you can receive truth on one subject um, but not on another and if you've got an error or a false belief about something in your soul about a certain subject um, then that precludes the truth on that same subject. Like you can't have the truth while you've still got the false belief about it. You have to release the false belief. And that's why emotion is such a good, you know, such a good thing because you feel the emotion, you feel the false belief, so to speak. Yeah, and it is a feeling. You need to feel about, about it. And then as you feel, that, that releases it and then makes room for a new belief to come in. And if you want the truth, you have to want it. Like you could get rid of certain things but not desire to have the truth on a subject come into your soul or to understand the truth of a matter. And if you don't desire to understand it, God's, God's laws work on desire. So does the earth, so does the spirit world. So the faster that you can learn how to develop desire and act on your desires and live your desires and if they're in harmony with love, there'll be great joy and happiness. If your desires are out of harmony with love, then you have pain and suffering. But just developing desire stands you in very good stead for when you go to the spirit world. So another way to illustrate it, just for the container, like your soul being a container kind of thing. So here's our soul. And it's got all, all different things, you know, in it. So let's say we've got some unloving stuff here. Going on. And then maybe we've got some like loving things going on too, like beliefs or whatever. And we've got all, anyway, I've just got all kinds of stuff in there. Now, the way it works is that God's love can come into us. Like we long for God's love. We have a prayer and a longing and a passionate desire to receive God's love. God's love pours into our soul. Emotional, emotional process there. And as it pours into the soul, so here, then, and depending on what subject, you know, uh, it, well, say you've longed for God's love or, or you've, oh uh, yeah, so God's love pushes, it goes into the soul and then some of it releases. Now God's truth is a wonderful thing. Say you, say here, this one here, is that, you know, you believe that well, for me, as a woman, you're inferior. Now, you can long for the truth about that, and you can long and say, hold on, like, this is my belief, what's the truth on that, God? And you can long for God's love, and God's love can bring truth on that. And God's love is, no, women are not inferior. Women and men are, you know, the genders are equal. I've made there to be equal. Different, there's differences in the sense of the expression and stuff, but you're one soul, and um, inequality is created by a painful thing created by humans. So God's love comes in. Oh, I shouldn't have done the arrows black, but it's just because it's the best color that you can see. Let's use blue. God's love. So God's love pours in on truth, and we've just talked about gender equality. And that here is pushed out. So out it goes because I've now released that belief that women are inferior or less than men and it goes because God's love has now given me the truth and it's told me the truth on that subject and I'm like ah oh, well that's gone now and then I have God's truth about that matter which is no it's equal so here's a love based belief now based on God's love of like no this is a, a love based belief so there we had God's love coming in and I wanted the truth on a certain matter here the error was, was expelled, and that all dissipates because I felt it, so it's gone. And God's love was because I, I desired the truth on that matter. Now I have that feeling inside of me, and I know for certain that it's real because I've received that truth from God, and that is, has come in and helped change my soul. 
Now, I might have all these other, so this black bit was, you know, the false beliefs, remember? And the feelings that are out of harmony with love. I may still have those on all kinds of different subjects, you know, going on. But on this subject about gender equality, I now have the truth from God about that. And that's sort of how it, how it goes. So the most rapid way and the way to get the fastest truthful information, as I said previously, is by having a relationship from God. And if you're willing to be humble and you have faith in that process and you desire to love and you want the truth, wow, like a lot of cool things can happen there. So to me, it just seems like a matter of working through anything in me that's in disharmony with love and truth, anything that is out of harmony with love and truth. Anything that prevents my relationship with God, that to me seems the best thing to get rid of first, because then that's the fastest way that you can grow, by receiving love from God. So anything that, um, you know, any beliefs that I have about love, any beliefs I have about God that are out of harmony with love and truth, seems to me logical to get rid of all of those because then you can have a direct connection with um, your, your real parent God and God can then help to, to work through various things. When I say that, God's not going to just magically take stuff out of you and God's not going to magically heal you and make it all better. Like that religious belief in Christianity is all bollocks or for want of a better word. It's not true. It's absolutely not true. We as humans make decisions and choices. Because we make decisions and choices, we're responsible for then the cleanup. You know, it's like, it's like say, we're like, we are like children. So in, in your home as a parent, if a child makes a mess, technically, like if we were loving that child, we would just say to them, hey, look, you made a mess, it needs to be cleaned up. If they had had no previous um, training and that was just the expectation, you know, because it was a love-based thing, like I make a mess, I clean it up, they'd clean it up. Now often what parents do is parents then go and they actually clean up the mess for the child for many, many different reasons. Like I've talked to many parents who are just like, well, it's faster, it's easier. It's just such a like time consuming if I let the child do it. Uh, you know, you know, oh, they can't do it properly. Well, we've got to learn sometime. Now, if we go up messing, you know, cleaning up messes, that's not what God does. God doesn't clean up our messes. A good parent would, would, would help, would educate the child. So, for instance, if a child spilt water, then, you know, they'd educate the child on, on what kind of cleaning gear to get, how, you know, absorbent cloths, how to wipe it up, ensure that it was wiped up, would probably let them know, like, if you leave it there, you might slip over and you could hurt yourself. But you'd educate them. You'd take the time and you'd lovingly correct what had done in the sense of just saying, hey, look, this is spilt, this is how you clean it up, this is what, you know, and you could apply that to, to, to any number of scenarios. You could do it to the dishes that, you know, you have at night. You, they have a meal and then they go and wash their plates up. Now you need to teach them how to wash and dry a dish properly. They need to, like, you know, use soap and run some water, put some soap in, scrub off all the dirt, rinse it so that there's no soap still in there so you don't eat soap next time not use too much soap, you know, like there's all these things that you learn when you learn how to wash a dish. So you'd educate the child. Now once they're educated, you'd, you know, they need to then every time that they make the dish dirty, they need to go wash it and clean it. And it's their responsibility to do that. Well, that's how God treats us. God says, hey, I want you to become educated, self-responsible beings because I know that's going to make you the happiest that you can possibly be and you'll get a lot of sense of satisfaction from being able to do that. So when we make a mess, and unfortunately as adults we make a lot bigger messes than children do spilling a glass of water or face painting or painting you know, the walls of a house or something, often we actually tear apart relationships. We, due to not feeling fear or whatever, we create wars and you know, we, we mur like there's murder and there's all kinds of pain and suffering that we create. And as a, you know, in our life as parents, you know, say if there's abuse in a family, then that is us, you know, abusing children. Or it might not be you personally. I'm using like the royal us in the sense of collectively. In society, for instance, there's certain issues. So there's a lot of sexual abuse problems. There's a lot of physical abuse problems. Um, there's a lot of mental abuse problems. Like, I know spirit, there is spiritual abuse problems. You, if we think about it, let's take like an extreme example. So in a family, there's um, domestic violence. 
Now, God's not just going to magically take everyone out because otherwise that would have already happened, but it's actually not going to help us learn. Because we created that situation in the first place, and you might say, well, it's not my choice as an adult to be in a, in a domestic violence you know, situation. There's certain things and conditions that are created within our souls that cause us to actually accept violence, you know, if we're staying in that situation. And there's certain conditions that our parents taught us that cause us to feel that it's okay and acceptable to be violent to another person. From God's perspective, that's not loving, being violent to another person and actually accepting violence or absorbing violence. Neither of those loving, if we look at the partner questions, you know, what would love motivate me to do for myself? Well, if you're in an abusive envi environment, love for yourself would motivate you to leave. You might stand up and try and resolve the issue in a, in a love-based way, you know, talk about it, raise the issue, etc., etc. But in the end, you may have to leave that relationship if the other party chose not to change. That's what love of self would do. Now, love of your partner, love your partner, you would speak up and you'd say, there is a problem. You know, being violent to me is, is not okay. And being violent to, say, if the kids too, being violent to the children here, that's not okay either. That's what love would do. And what do you fear that your partner's love would motivate them to do for themselves? Well, if they loved and they analysed that question in a domestic violence situation, they would need to look at themselves and go, well, hold on, love of myself dictates that I'm actually being, you know, I'm not being very loving here by not expressing my emotions in a self-responsible manner. I'm actually attacking someone violently in order to avoid a whole lot of other things that are going on for me or to gain power or control or whatever the motivation is that someone wants to be violent to another person. You know, I want to feel better or superior, whatever it is, or because I can. Well, love of themselves would dictate that they'd work through emotionally all those issues because just by basic ethics, you can see that domestic violence isn't loving. You wouldn't want to be hammered or hurt or harmed. So, you know, doing it to another person isn't very loving. And then what would love what would my partner's love for me dictate they do for me? Well, if you're in a domestic, um, you know, violent situation and you really wanted to love and you were the one who is perpetuating the violence, you would have to look at it and go, hold on, it's really not loving to hit someone else. It, it's not loving to abuse them or, depending what domestic violence it was, you know, it might be emotional abuse or all kinds of stuff, uh, sexual abuse, etc. You'd be like, no, that's not loving. So. Can you see even those questions of just examining what love would do could cut out a lot of domestic violence. It doesn't mean yet you'd, that'd just be the first step of correcting the, these problems, but you'd then need to go through an emotional go through an emotional experience in order to release all of those issues and, and find the causes of what it is. And you might need time apart in order that the children are safe and that your partner's safe and for each party to work through issues, you know. If, if one party can't control their violent urges, then they're going to need to do that. But God's, it's not God's fault that those things happen. It's humanity's fault. It's humanity's problem. We are acting those. We are doing those things. God never does anything that is unloving, ever, ever. But we, humanity, do. And it's our responsibility to correct it. So when I'm talking about you know, this, how you can long for God's love and it can correct you if you have a, a pure desire. Absolutely. But God's not going to magical it all away. God's not going to make it all perfect for you or take away your sins and everything's going to be resolved. The taking away of your sins is by you making initially the effort. It's like you going, no wow, like I can feel that this is wrong. I want to make a change. I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to do a uh, uh, to make a change. I'm going to educate myself. I'm going to feel through all of my emotions. I'm going to find out about what the loving thing to do here is. And you'd do it. You'd absolutely do it wholeheartedly. And that's when then God can help you the most because your desire now is set. And in God's laws, desire, if you activate your own desire, then you can actually engage the higher laws of love. So in this case, a domestic violence situation, the law of compensation eventually is going to get in the sense of it's doing the wrong thing, it's doing the wrong thing. You feel the compensation, you, you start, you know, it feels bad, you get hurt, things, you know, it, it, you get tired, you can't cope. There's, like, there's all kinds of different things that are going to happen. And that's just God's laws trying to say, hey, there's a problem, this is not loving, this is not loving. But if you activate your desire, then the law of forgiveness and repentance can come into play. 
and you can, you're going to need to examine if you're in a partner relationship in a domestic violence situation, how did you get there? You know, how did you become this violently abusive person? How did you, you know, how did the other party become the person who's absorbing and accepting all of this violence? How did you get to that place? What has happened to you in your past? And what choices have you made in order that you end up in that situation? Because that if you can figure those out and heal those, and you actually work through those in an emotional um, way, an emotional experience, then God can help you to, to work through that. For children in domestic violence situation, completely different. It's not their fault that they're there. That's, that's the adults in the environment that is, has created that. So it is the adult's responsibility to actually heal and correct the, the lack of love that's in that environment. Um, for children in that situation, it's very difficult because they are forced, really. Uh, you know, in a way, it's kind of like prison. They can't really leave, they can't get out, and then they're subjected to all of this unloving things that isn't their fault. As they get older and then they leave that home environment, they will then make their own choices. And you know, statistically, some people choose to um, you know, re do what their parents did, and they then have another generation of domestic violence. But there are also many cases of people who choose completely differently and they don't and that I love that because there's there's a choice someone saying no that that wasn't right that wasn't good that wasn't loving I'm going to try and do something different and there's they've obviously then got a whole lot of emotions because there's a lot of fear and sadness and anger and gosh any many 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 emotions that would come up I think working through situations like that the illustration was to, to say that God doesn't magically do it. It's not like you can go to church when you pass, you're going to be better, but then everything's going to be okay. That's not how it works. You, what you have done, you need to make right. But God can help you because there's some things you can never make right. For instance, if you, um, you, know, if you did kill somebody, you can never give them back their life. And then everyone that you affected you know, because of the, that's an extreme example, but everyone you affected by killing them, so their partner, their children, their family, their work colleagues, just the fact of that they don't get to be their full nature and personality and express their soul passions and desires in life. You know, you had part, part responsibility in that. There's other factors that, that they contribute to, but you actually took that life. Now, God, you can't make that better for everybody else because that's, that you can't, that's out of your control. All you can do is heal the reasons and what caused you to do it so that you never, ever, ever do it again. And what I notice is people who are truly repentant, they often actually try and educate others about you know, what the, uh, the pain of, of what, what it happens when you do that. They, they try and make it right. Like, you know, I've heard of people visiting you know, say they've, they've done some crime, like say a murder or, or often rape and things like that, and they try and uh, go to the, you know, actually talk to the victim, to the person's family who they harmed and try and make it right or, you know, go through a process of repentance really. And then often they run programs like, look, this is not what to do and things like that and try and educate other people about, I mean, I, I kind of see it as trying to educate them not to do it. Or, For example, I found, like I came to see that what I was doing was wrong as a parent and that I was actually harming the children in our care by not working through my own emotions, by not taking responsibility for how I felt about things, by all of the false beliefs and, you know, error, meaning things out of harmony with God's version of love and truth that I was basically um, modelling to the children and via my soul reinforcing to them that that was right and good, you know, when it were, totally wasn't from God's perspective. And what I found over time is at first I really wasn't that interested. I just wanted the kids' behaviour to change because it affected me and made me feel bad. And there's the compensation, like the law of compensation, which is a lower law of love, just sort of grinding away, going, yeah, what you're doing's not good. Here's the pain, you know, you, it's going to be more pain and more pain if you keep doing the same thing. And I found if I kept doing the same thing, it did, it felt more and more and more terrible. Then when I started doing a different thing, you know, like I changed my, my actions and I got to a point where I was like, wow, hold on, 
it's just so painful. I want to do something different so that, you know, love, like that, it, it, that, it, that the behaviour and what's happening in our family is different. I didn't necessarily yet have a pure desire, I didn't have a pure desire to love yet. But I started to go, no, this isn't good, and started working, I suppose, you know, compensating for all the bad things I'd done. I tried to, tried to, a lot of effort went into trying to make them different. It wasn't until I started making the soul-based shifts um, and actually emotionally working through issues and actually feeling the results of what I'd done and actually feeling what it was. And that's quite an interesting process because I was feeling over a period of time this happened when I had more of a desire to love was that I found that at first it was just sort of to get away from what well, it was, just to get away from the pain of what was immediately happening in life. It just felt like it was too much and too overwhelming. But we got to a point where life was just a lot better. And then there was the decision that I, need, I made of, no, I really want to love. Like, I want to know what love is and I want to um, really like, actually have a parent from a place of love, not out of obligation, not out of, like, duty, not out of just, you know, I just w had a feeling that I wanted to love, like, I wanted to be a parent like God parents. That was, that's literally my, the, the prayer I had in the first, like, God, show me what it means to be a parent as God parent. And... I, as I said, I got uh, Jesus and Mary, her friends of mine, and they gave. They speak a lot about parenting and how you know God's version of parenting, and what well, not a lot because not a lot of people are very open actually to um, hearing all that information. But they have done some key talks, and they have done uh, hundreds of hours on getting an education in love and what love is, and what a lot of what love isn't. And those things I I listen to extensively, and particularly like the parenting stuff, but also just about love and what did it mean to love and, I, and developing it, what does it mean to develop a desire to love and all this anyway. So I began to have, generate my own desire to love and that's when I, I feel like, and then I would uh, emotionally go through certain things and I don't feel like I've fully forgiven or repented for, certain, for, for anything, not fully, but I started, I feel like there's a difference in the feeling of it because what I see when someone repents or having a different feeling is that I sort of went from just wanting to correct the behavior to make it better for me, is that now I have this really like strong feeling in me of like, no, I really want to like um, correct what I've done wrong, like to, to now and educate the children in what actually is love. Even if they choose not to do it, I still want them to know that what I taught them wasn't love. It, it absolutely isn't love. So that if they come to a point where they decide that, oh, okay, I actually want to, you know, work through wherever they're at, because, and this is what I'm saying, without God, I'm stuffed. Like, I can't make the children change or to accept what is love, ever, ever, because I've already taught them the wrong thing, and now they have a choice. The only way that they're going to be able to work through that and not pass it on to the next generation is by them choosing to. Or, and also God can also take away, um, if they have a desire to, anything that I created in them, um, if that is a desire they have so that they don't have all of the, um, the, suppose, all of the unlovingness or errors and false beliefs that I imposed upon them. I feel like God can take those away. I'm still exploring this. But I just know that there's a difference in, yeah, the compensation and feeling of like, oh, this, this feels bad and I've got to take, you know, do something to change to this heartfelt feeling of like, no, I want to love and that means that I will do whatever it takes to correct everything I have done wrong. You know, I want to correct what, is, what I did wrong and, and do, you know, and make it right. In the instance of me with parenting, I can't, I can't correct all of the onflow effects that I have created, but God can help with that. And this is the, the point we're talking about is that God doesn't just come and magically take away things. You have to have a desire and, a, and want to actually correct the, the damage that you have created as a human. And then God can actually assist in that process. And I think that's a very loving provision that God has created. Because if we didn't have that provision, we'd just go doing all kinds of harm and mayhem and may, you know, terrible, terrible things and expect God to clean up afterwards. Just like if we put it, look at a human, you know, human beings, you know, a lot of parents are cleaning up after their kids. God doesn't just go around cleaning up human, humanity's messes. That wouldn't be a loving provision to do. If you imagine, you know, in a family, 
if when the parents just clean up all the mess of a child, a child thinks that they can do no wrong, there's no problem. But when a child sincerely tries to, to do, you know, to clean up damage they've done or is sincerely sorry, then I feel like, you know, if you, if you love, then you would also like do everything that you could to support them to do it, you know, to clean up that mess or, or to do it. And most of the time, you know, if they're, they're little physical things, it's not going to be a, be a big issue. But sometimes there's things that happen in a family that cause a lot of pain and suffering. And I feel like God just is waiting for humanity to say, yeah, we've caused a lot of damage and a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. and We've done a lot of sin. And it's just waiting for our hearts to get to the point where we're like, wow, we can see we've done wrong and we want to correct that. And I feel as soon as humanity, and you know, this, you can do it as an individual, when collectively it would have a lot of power, I feel, and, and positive results, but it's an individual decision in order for us to become a collective to do it. As soon as we have a desire to correct the harm that we have done and the damage that we have created, then God can work with us and God can also help us, particularly in the parts that we can't change and we can't, you know, we, we can't correct. But if our desire is pure to do everything we can to correct it, we will just keep, keep doing it, keep trying, um, and, and eventually we will work through that emotionally to the point where you'd actually know what the loving thing to do and you'd understand all the reasons why you did, the, did what you did. You'd understand all of the effects that it had on others you'd understand and, and you know, you would have had to go through a lot of the feelings of the damage that it created to other people's lives and how it's affected them. And I feel like that's a little bit like what I've noticed with um, the children is that at first it went from being just like I wanted it to change, kind of for my own benefit. Now I feel this real, very, very, very strong feeling of no, I need to correct the damage that I've done and the unlovingness that I've created. And I want to educate the children in what love actually is, or at least the principles of how they can figure out what love is. Because they now have inherited certain things and their dad and I have created certain things in them that they are acting upon. And I feel like, well, no, I need to like re-educate them and say, no, that was wrong. Like I did that wrong. Again, it's up to them what they choose. And I can't change that now because they have free will and they have the action you know and I can't get angry and try and enforce them or force them to either because that would be me being even more unloving and it's really interesting because I now like watch them doing things directly I can see wow I can see why they act in that way or why they behave in that manner directly from something I did or their dad did um, you know or encouraged them or allowed in them or that was out of harmony with love and I can see and I observe the pain now that the children are in and just the way that it's affecting their life in a negative manner. And, you know, you can almost see what it's going to, well, you can kind of see where it's headed if no change was made. And so though I can encourage them to make changes and let them know about the benefits if they, they release these, these injuries that they've inherited and all of that, you know, I can't actually remove it from them. Only they and, and you know, a relationship with God if they want one, can do that. So repentance and forgiveness are pretty amazing, um, amazing laws, actually, but are only activated with desire. And, yeah, and part of this parenting um, resource that, is, that I'm creating is that it's a way to just share with other parents that making positive change before you become a parent or when your children are very young, but even if they've grown up now, just by you making changes, the positive onflow effects that can have on the next generation and it can have on your children. Um, I feel that if parents made shifts, you know, in a couple of generations, we could have completely different family dynamics and many, many, many problems in the world would be resolved if parents chose to love rather than to selfishly get their own addictions met. And I feel very strongly about that because I can see how my unloving decisions have impacted and, st and affect the children completely. You know, when you kind of imagine into the future of what the children will be like if, if they don't make any changes, you know, they're going to probably be quite unloving to other people as well. Well, there's some responsibility I feel with me in that because that's what I educated them was okay. Then I educated them that it was all right to treat people like that. And it's one thing to tell, tell someone 
that, hey, like that's an unloving thing to do. But until you actually go through the feeling and experiencing of the pain that it causes to treat another person in an unloving way, you kind of don't necessarily see it because you're too obsessed about what you want or what you get out of it. So there's a lot of learning that happens, you know, along, along, this, along, the, along the way of, well, of God's way and coming to understand what love is. I feel really excited about the potential there is for parents to make loving change in the home. And yeah, I'd be very, very keen to see then what happens with children and in all areas of their life. I've already observed when parents, you know, own their own emotions, and that means, you know, feeling and experiencing their own emotions in a self-responsible way, the positive dynamic that has on the family. It's the same for partners, the positive impact it has by allowing yourself to experience your own emotions, by being truthful and transparent with each other. Just so many positive on-flow effects. It's worth experimenting and giving it a go. And depending on what your family dynamics is, I mean, it, this resource is shared for free. You can pass it on to others. And it doesn't, it, all it takes is your own effort. There's not really any resources that you need by your own desire and developing that. Uh, pen and paper is obviously quite handy to write down notes or, and also to measure um, how, how you go and changes along the way. It's an individual process. It doesn't rely on anyone else, which I think is wonderful. Imagine if you had to wait for someone else to change before you could. This resource can be used by parents and, and in the partnership to bring more love into your relationships with your partner and also with the children. So that brings me to the end of this presentation and I wish you all the best until I see you next time.